Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Jesus said this to test him, for Jesus himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were terrified. But Jesus said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of our Savior. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I come to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I grew up in a world full of miracles. Divine interventions happen to everyday people. And one of my personal favorite miracle stories that I heard as a kid was told by Sister Peggy a tongue-talking member of my Pentecostal church in southern Illinois. The story goes like this. One night, while driving home from an out-of-town revival meeting in a car full of good church-going believers, Sister Peggy ran plumb out of gas somewhere along Highway 50. She buried that needle six feet under the capital E on her gasoline gauge. And as luck would have it, there wasn't a filling station to be found for miles around. But she did just happen to have a gallon of Kool-Aid in her trunk, which gave her a Holy Ghost idea. 
You see, Sister Peggy reckoned that if Jesus could turn water into wine, then he surely wouldn't have a problem turning, turning a jug of Kool-Aid into gas. And so she poured that tropical punch into her Pontiac. And according to her sworn testimony, she and her apostolic band drove the rest of the way home without a hitch. Now I know you might be thinking, Father John, do you really believe that story? Well, I don't know. When I pour Kool-Aid into my children, they start running around at 60 miles per hour, so why wouldn't it do the same for an automobile? Where I come from, miracles happen. Or at least they used to. Some of them seem a little silly, like the story about Sister Peggy and her tropical punch. Others seem a bit mundane, like God providing a prime parking spot in the Walmart Supercenter lot on a Friday night after payday. But others were more consequential, like an illness that the doctors deemed terminal, going into remission after an all-night prayer meeting. Or a bag of groceries showing up on your front porch just as you were wondering where your next family meal was going to come from. Or an unexpected check in the mailbox on the very day your utilities were scheduled to get shut off. These miracle stories, all of these miracle stories, were really quite diverse. But most of them seem to have a common storyline. It went like this. The facts are there just isn't enough. Not enough gas in the tank. Not enough health in the body. Not enough groceries in the pantry. Not enough money in the bank. But then Jesus shows up and as it turns out, there's more than enough. In fact, there's an abundance. That's basically the storyline of the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 that we read about this morning. As Jesus and his friends are taking a break up on the mountain, Jesus sees a whole mess of hungry bodies coming towards him. And he says to his disciples, Hey, fellas, how much cash would it take to feed all these people? Check your wallets, friends. You think we've got enough money to buy everybody lunch? And Philip says, Look, Jesus, even if we ordered off the dollar menu at McDonald's, it would still take more than six months' wages to feed this multitude. There just isn't enough to go around. Andrew agrees. He even commandeers some poor kid's lunchbox and says, Here's the facts, Jesus. We ain't got enough snacks, Jesus. Five loaves and two fish just ain't going to cut it, Jesus. There's not enough in the box, Jesus, to feed the 5,000, Jesus. And Andrew ain't wrong. No matter how you slice it, the facts are there is not enough food in the box to provide everyone a square meal. There's hardly enough for a decent coffee hour after church, let, al let alone lunch for a multitude. There is not enough in the box. And that's a fact. If you read the Gospels, you'll find that people are always telling Jesus the facts. People are always telling Jesus that there's not enough. The facts are, Jesus, there isn't enough wine at this wedding. So we better go ahead and shut down the party. The facts are, Jesus, there's not enough room for all these unvaccinated children. So we better send them away from your presence. The facts are, Jesus, there's not enough love, 
Not enough mercy and not enough healing for everyone, especially those living on the hungry, hopeless side of town. So, why bother making friends with the Samaritan, Jesus? The people are always telling Jesus the facts. And before we get too judgmental, we've got to admit that the people aren't always wrong. This morning, Philip and Andrew are not wrong. There isn't enough food in the box to feed the 5,000. And that's a fact. Heck, there's barely enough in the box to feed five Strattons. The fact is, there's not enough food in the box, but as we see today, Jesus is not limited to the boxes of scarcity that we use to pack our lunches. As the scripture says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So sure, it's the fact there's not enough fish in the box to feed the multitude. But there's more than enough fish in the sea to feed all God's children. Sure, it's a fact there's not enough bread in the box to feed the 5,000. But there's more than enough amber fields of grain to put bread on every family's table. There might not be enough in the box. But there's enough manna in the desert. There's enough water in the rock. There's enough food for the journey. Jesus knew this gospel truth. Jesus is this gospel truth. And somehow or another, Jesus tapped into God's abundance and provided food enough for everybody in the wilderness. But how did he do it, you might ask? Well, some folks say that Jesus simply inspired the 5,000 to share with each other the resources that they had already brought with them up on the mountain. This makes sense because you know that there had to have been more than a few parents in that crowd who brought enough goldfish crackers to feed a grade school soccer team. So maybe Jesus' example of generosity had a, a ripple effect throughout the multitude, and that's how he did it. Some folks like that explanation, but to be honest, I don't much care for it. It takes the miracle out of the miracle. It limits God's actions to that of human hands, uh, so, how did he do it, preacher? Uh, what do you think he did, preacher? Well, I like to believe that the same spirit that hovered over the primordial waters called forth the elements of the sea to provide fish on the mountain. I like to believe that the one who said, let the earth spring forth vegetation, drew together the grains of the field to provide bread to all those children. I like to believe that what happened on the mountain was no less than divine intervention because I tend to believe that we depend on more than human works for our ultimate salvation. But who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe what happened on the mountain really was just a simple act of sharing. That too, after all, is pretty amazing. Some, some people might even say, miraculous. But either way, Philip and Andrew were right about one thing. There wasn't enough in the box. But they were wrong about the most important thing. There's always enough with Jesus. A long time ago on a mountain in Galilee, Philip and Andrew looked into a small box with a few loaves and a couple of fish. And they said to Jesus, Lord, there's not enough. And here we are, 2,000 years later, doing the same golden thing. 
We look into the small boxes on the calendar. Crammed full of meetings, emails, deadlines, and appointments. And we say to Jesus, Lord, there's just not enough time for the people I love and the relationships I need. We look into the small box called capitalism, where everybody competes for the same five loaves of barley, and the poor are consistently turned away empty, and we say to Jesus, Lord, there just isn't enough bread for everybody. We look into the small box of for-profit medicine, where the quality of your care depends on the size of your wallet. And we say to Jesus, Lord, there just isn't enough healing to go around. We look into the small box of our curated social media, where everyone on our news feed shares the same views and prejudices. And we say to Jesus, Lord, there just isn't enough room for alternate perspectives or opinions. So my friends, here's my question for us today. What small box are you getting your facts from? What small box is limiting your imagination? What small box has got you believing that there simply is not enough? Like Andrew and Philip, many of our facts come from small boxes, but fortunately these facts don't stop Jesus from performing miracles. In fact, just this month, on July 15th, a miracle happened for thousands of families across this nation. Millions of parents and guardians opened their bank accounts and found something the IRS is calling a child tax credit, but what I like to call some much needed loaves and fishes. It's estimated that these loaves and fishes will lift millions of children out of poverty and help a great multitude of families, much more than 5,000, pay the mortgage, feed the baby, cover education expenses, pay for child care, and keep the lights on. As one patron of our food ministry, whose family is a recipient of these loaves and fishes, said just the other day, this is going to change everything. This is going to change everything. This is going to change everything. Now, I imagine that Andrew and Philip will try to take us back to the lunch box policies of need and scarcity. They're going to say, perhaps with all sincerity, there's not enough, Jesus. This isn't sustainable, Jesus. There's not enough bread in the box for the children, Jesus. And that might be true. There might not be enough in the box. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's enough fish in the sea and enough grain in the fields for all God's children. So yeah, our boxes might be small, barely big enough to hold just a few loaves and a couple of fish. But friends, miracles happen outside the box. And some of the best miracle stories begin with somebody saying to Jesus, Lord, there's not enough. At least, that's the experience of the preacher standing in the small box in front of you. Amen.